Cool. Okay. Well, um, let's kick off. I'm sure there'll be a, a few more people, but I'll, um, I'll add them through as, um, as they come in. Um, but yeah, wanted to welcome everyone to the uh, latest London Infrastructure Group event. Um, this is going to be a roundtable on the evolution of the service desk. Um, the key things we're going to cover are how the service desk has changed, especially over the last year with COVID. Um, what the challenges, uh, what challenges have come through with COVID and, and how that has affected it. Um, the importance of customer service uh, on the service desk. Um, and then also how we can develop and build out um, highly functioning service desk teams and what the future looks like with AI, chatbots, that kind of thing. Um, really, we, this, this roundtable is for people to um, get an idea as to what the future is in store uh, for the service desk. Um, it's for managers of service desks to um, have a good idea as to how they can upskill their staff and um, really just giving a, a, an overall um, idea as to what service desk analysts can do and how they can progress within, within companies as it's usually the entry position um, into a, an IT function of, of, of any organisation. So firstly, um, I'll get everyone to introduce themselves. So uh, Bavin, if, if you'd like to go first. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Bavin Shah. Um, I've come in, in terms of my background, I've, I've come up through the operational space, uh, very much been uh, previously focused in, in um, tech infrastructure capabilities, uh, looking after infrastructure teams. Um, and then the last kind of 12 or 15 years or so have been really focused around the service management side of things, um, which is where my passion for this subject has, has grown. Um, and is still growing on a on a day to day basis, so it's it's never never boring. Um, so I'm delighted to be here talking to you guys about uh, some of these concepts. Thank you. Brilliant. And Francis. Hi, my name is Francis. Um, I I started with a slightly different story. Um, uh, I started with a bit of a niche in the in the EPOS department, electronic point of sales. And then as a, from there, I kind of transitioned into a junior IT support analyst, and this is where I kind of grew myself in that field and got a better understanding and obviously is here to kind of contribute uh, what I see from the progression and the, um, the growth of the service desk. Perfect. And Glenn? Hi, Glenn Corey. Uh, 20 odd years, my second career, I'm that old. Um, 20 odd years service delivery management experience, uh, particularly around growing, building, turning around dysfunctional, and slightly backward service desks. So, uh, you know, pretty much is, whilst I've looked after the whole remit of service management um, and operations within companies, my big passion at the end of the day is service desks. Brilliant. So um, I guess to kick off, uh, the, the big question is, you know, how has the service desk changed over the last 12 months, especially with uh, all what COVID has, has brought to us? Did you want me to go first? Um, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, okay. So, well, I, I think if we if we rewind the the clock a little bit in terms of where the service desk was, let's say pre pre pandemic, and you know, for those on the on the call that might not be from Generation uh, Z or Generation Alpha, as it's now now known, um, you know, we, we the service desk has really become uh, or has significantly shifted away from what used to be let's restore our services that are broken as quickly as possible to now, you know, ensuring how do we, how do we make, make sure that these incidents don't occur again, right? So that, that shift has been significant with the birth of <clears throat> practices and frameworks like ITIL. Um, and of course, the uh, sophistication within the tool sets that are at our, our disposal um, uh, that, that enable a lot more um, capability at the fingertips of the of the service desk analyst in 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 today's term. Uh, in, you know the the correct investment, the right level of maturity, uh, arming the teams with with that kind of capability can be a very very powerful um, service desk. And actually, you know, you mentioned earlier about the bots, and you know now as we enter the or we are part of the generation alpha and the bots are you know the age of the bots is is coming but actually 
you know, there is a lot that needs to happen to, to make the bot successful, um, you know, and, and therefore the strength of things like processes, practices, um, putting in place the, the right level of measurements um, across all these areas to make sure that they're actually integrating quite well um, is kind of where, where many organizations are at the, at the moment in terms of service desks. And, you know, if you talk about kind of COVID and, and the impact of, of COVID, my God, <laughs> I wonder actually how many companies were really prepared for what was about to hit them in February, March last year. Um, and and in terms of whether it was uh, preparation in terms of technology, connectivity, tools, collaboration tools, you know, the, the licenses, you name it, um, you know, and, and it was, uh, you know, I, I was in that situation and, and some companies were able to move a lot more um, swiftly than, than others. Um, mm-hmm. But actually there was a bit of a, a bit of a wake up call because, you know, not many business continuity plans kind of included uh, this type of activity, right? Um, and um, I think in terms of the service desk analysts themselves and, and the people on the service desk, I think if I can sum it up, I would say people lost touch with people, um, you know, because suddenly you were, your, your best friend was, was screen time, became your best friend. Um, you know, when you're on a service desk, you tend you tend to have big screens around you telling you kind of what's going on, the calls are waiting or uh, turn around and say, hey, I need help with this. And all of that dynamic just, just went out of the window. And therefore, you know, what, what needed to be introduced was how do we collaborate? How do we increase our level of collaboration within the teams to check in um, both on a professional level and actually more importantly, even on a personal level, because, you know, individuals were thrown into situations where they were not having, you know, they were having to work from home, uh, which meant that uh, there were potential dis- distractions out there, and uh, we all had to get used to unmuting ourselves uh, when having having calls. Um, but I think for for service desk managers, particularly or, or supervisors, you know, I think a dynamic that played up was how do we measure productivity, right? Uh, because line of sight was not there, and therefore a lot of thought needed to go into what does performance look like? How do we make sure the quality doesn't dip? Because, you know, when the pandemic hit, hit all the service desk call volumes went up, they shot up tremendously. And so they had to, they had to do more. What were we going to do in terms of upskilling these, these teams? I'll let uh, Francis or Glenn kind of try. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look at it slightly different way. Um, and how, for a lot of companies, um, the service desk now has become a much higher reputation than it used to have, which in turn has raised the reputation of IT. Um, you know, I, I've been speaking to a senior manager this week about it, and I, you know, I finished off a contract back in September, and the last conversation I had with the CIO there, and he wrote an article, he's a very well-known CIO, who wrote an article in CIO magazine about the whole experience of his company and how the service desk both enhance their reputation, enhance the reputation of IT at a board level because it became such an opportunity space. Whereas before people may use service desk or may not, it really did for an awful lot of people. Suddenly you need to look for myself who's a, you know been a service management leader and a service disc leader you you almost enforce something that you'd wanted for a long time which was the service disc becoming that single point of contact and through that the the companies that have coped best have been those companies that, that who had the service desks that were able to meet that expectation and meet that head on of really becoming that single point of contact really being that, that real face of IT and I think you know I, I've always said to teams that work for me that ultimately you want the service desk to be the shop window and if the shop window is looking good you really made the reputation for the rest of IT so I think the, the whole focus now is very much around service desk and through that suddenly you've got the opportunity 
with internal teams as well to suddenly change the perception of what the service desk is from being, uh, as we said at the beginning of this conversation, almost that entry level position. You now have the ability to think a bit differently about the kind of skills you want on a service desk if you're going to, because I, I think for a lot of companies, and I know, you know, I've been talking to people this week about it, a lot of companies are not going to be going back to the office. They are, you know, was it HSBC this week have turned around and said that, you know, they're only going to be using 40% of their office space going forward. It's going to be an awful lot of companies that are moving much more into a permanent mode of people working virtually. And that means that a really good service desk that, that really runs and is able to be that front face of IT is going to become so important. And suddenly the staff that you're going to want on the service desk, it, it, it becomes a whole different ball game of the type of skills that you're going to want in that front line. Um, if you're really going to, going to make IT successful going forward. Yeah, just, off the back of, just off the back of what um, obviously Bavin and uh, Glenn have said, um, I, I feel that the pandemic has been a bit of a blessing for the service desk in terms of, it's been a catalyst for um, the quick evolution of the service desk. I mean, yep. there were several talks about, or uh, we know where we want the service desk to be in five, 10 years time. And obviously pandemic hit, uh, so many businesses were in positions where they didn't, as, as Bavin said, didn't have a business continuity plan in place. I mean, every business has a disaster, or hopefully every business has a disaster recovery plan in place. Um, it came to realization that um, you had to adapt to the new way of working immediately. Um, again, just off the back of, of what Glenn said, um, it shines a light on the operation of tech. I mean, it allows uh, service desk to lead tech forward. It brings interest back into tech for the youngsters again. Uh, like it, it's got this um, character in the sense that. Uh, it was dying out in the sense that um, not that many youngsters and so on so were interested in uh, a, a tech support function or, or I work in tech so and so. And then having the ability to now be in your own environment whilst supporting a uh, multifunctional business um, mm. has given so open so many doors to youngsters, so many doors to other people, avenues mm. who wanted mm. to obviously take an interest into the service desk itself. And in doing so, you've got the opportunities that open up several avenues where if you want to go into application support, infrastructure, and so-and-so. Um, also, to add to that, uh, uh, you come to, as a service desk manager myself, I come to realisation that you have to immediately try and bring the, the whole squad to the same kind of knowledge base, um, uh, which in then, obviously, would contribute to trying to give the best service possible to the business. Um, uh, what Bavin said at the beginning is like uh, you've missed that um, personal interaction with your customers face to face to now transition into talking behind the screen. Some some of these guys or some of these uh, customers wouldn't want to show their face and you, we hit a few challenges here and there. So it's now bringing the team together as one and pointing down different challenges that we're going to face uh, to how we used to work to where we want to be. And it's just like um, immediately evolving the service desk from um, the old school uh, come face to face or I have a personal relationship with someone in the service desk. Can you sort this up to now? Click here, click there and so and so. Um, there was a brief discussion about bots. Um, we just before um, the pandemic, we had the actual opportunity to uh, revamp our whole um, ticketing system uh, in, in light it was kind of a lucky position in light of what, what was actually going to come come to us. We we wanted to now empower our customers to be able to kind of solve their issues before it comes to the service desk. And again, these these are type of ideas that were thought, uh, thought of in the past, which uh, again, the pandemic was a bit of a catalyst to try and bring these ideas forward. Yes, yeah. interesting points there. Um, I've really kind of picked up on the what you said Glenn around the uh, reputation of the service desk being improved now that that's probably been happening for quite some time you know pre-covid and how how have you guys uh, you know pushed this forward within your own organizations so um so I'll, I'll jump on that quickly um 
So again, uh, the light has been shined on the service desk. Um, now, from from issues, cases, service requests, incidents being logged, uh, it has to come through to the service desk. Now, uh, the service desk are in one of the strongest positions I see in tech because uh, we have to be able to regurgitate the information and make sure it transitions into the correct teams as quick as possible. Or, um, again, is uh, having the correct documentation, having the correct skilled engineers in the team to be able to solve the issues as quick as possible. I mean, you can walk up to my desk face-to-face uh, -face in the service desk, and if I happen to not know the issue, I mean, simple customer service can come into play and I can bide my time to then find a resolution for yourself whereas you're working from home uh, everybody now has their time handed back to themselves so the expectation of trying to get issues resolved is now and then quick as possible so it's the whole transition again increasing the knowledge of the team and and obviously um uh, yeah actually <laughs> that's it i feel like i'm going off on a tangent but that's <laughs> it yeah. <laughs> yeah that's kind of an interesting kind of between obviously bavin glenn and yourself, um, coming from myself, who is a senior engineer on a help desk, um, all of the points that you made are, are so valid. Um, obviously, one of the biggest things is, you know, um, there was the stigma about, you know, whether IT individuals can work from home. That's been kind of blown out the water now where we've been working at home now for a year perfectly well. So on that point of, like you said, HSBC, even Spotify now saying that they'll have their Obviously, they can work, yeah, they can work anywhere in the world. Um, you know, it's really, again, you know, just elaborating on what you guys were saying about shining a light on IT or the service desk as a whole. Um, yeah, we are right now, um, everything's on us, you know, and, you know, we have to prove that we can provide not, not even a service. We have to provide a higher level of service than we did if we were in the office. So, you know, we're not so much backs against the wall, but, you know, it's, 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 we're in a position where we have to prove ourselves. You, you, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, it's something that yeah. we, we really have to kind of run with and be like, okay, you know, be organized and, and things like that. Um, I think that in my case, I, um, for the company that I work for, um, I've been kind of lucky that, a lot of things were in place before the pandemic kind of happened, you know, so we were able to kind of organize ourselves and get, get, get things in place that enabled a majority of our business to work remotely. You know, we had, we had teams in place. We have our, 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 our um, remote software in place. Um, we had, um, all types of applications that enables us to work from home. Um, company that I'm working for really heavy on, obviously, um, uh, cloud, cloud functionality. So, you know, like I said, when the pandemic hit, um, we weren't kind of scrambling around to move everything to the cloud because we were in that transition anyway. And so, I think that's I think that's really key what you're saying. I, I ran the service desk at Cancer Research and I ran a full business continuity test in November 2019. So I had a team of nine working from home by November 2019. And I think that made all the difference. Everything was in the cloud. Hmm. We were ready to go. So when the pandemic hit, you know, everybody was in a good position. So I think that's key. Yeah. Like you say, if companies weren't ready come March, hmm. those are the companies that have really struggled. Yeah, 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 uh, uh, absolutely right. Yeah, 100%. Like, even when I speak to some of my peers, you know, and, and, and like, I discuss with them how I, how, how, what my day to day is, you know, some of them, you know, they're still struggling. They're like, oh, we haven't got VPN, or, you know, we can't obviously log on to a user's machine to do any form of troubleshooting. So I said, so how do you plan your day? You know, what is it that you do? What is your product? I mean, where's your productivity level? And they're like, well, you know, it's as of when, you know, if somebody mm. sends an email, I'm like, so you haven't got teams in place. I'm like, no. so I said, so not only from a productivity level, but also from a communications level as well. I said, how do you communicate with your users? You know, how do you build back that, 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 not so much bond, but how do you build back that friendship that you had with individuals before the pandemic happened? 
and you, you know it's really in trust, interesting right, the, right. The, the, yeah. yeah that's it you know because hmm. you know as a support engineer you know if you haven't got that kind of trust and that belief from whether it be your manager whether it be your manager's manager and stuff like that, then you know you, hmm. you're kind of fighting a losing battle because it's tough it is you know so yeah so that's kind of my take on it as an individual that is that um i don't do too much support per se but you know with all the first line and second and, and second line guys that work on my desk um i'm kind of like the go-to person you know i'm like the in between between the manager mm -hmm. and and and, mm -hmm. and the guys so when i speak to them like you know, I try to reassure them every day that, you know, at some point, you know, because at the end of the day is that we're only human and we all struggle at some point, you know, and, prog I mean, and productivity is going to be one of those things that is going to be, we're going to be watching that like a hawk, mm. you, you know? So that's the kind of situation that where I'm at, I'm not sure how anybody else is. You know, off the back of that, Jerome, like I, I, I do agree, the best part about... <laughs> Um, being a service desk manager before the, the pandemic kind of hit, it was um, making sure I had a, a kind of a personal relationship with each of my yes. uh, engineers. So working from home, like the trust is already there. Yeah. Like, there is going to be times, I know we've all done it uh, whilst working from home and you've got a lot of spare time on your hands where you can actually leave your desk and don't go and do something else in, in your house. And obviously once a, uh, uh, I know Boris has finally confirmed that uh, 21st of March we'll all be actively out and about. And this kind of gives, the best part about it, it kind of gives you your time back as well as trying to support a business, as well as it, it gives you a bit of a mental healing, if you understand. It's a bit difficult, obviously, we're still in the pandemic and we've still got so much restrictions, you can't really do much. But again, it's the whole relationship that I've with the team to allow them to, to work from home. I've got that trust, I've got that so-and-so. Yeah. And it's uh, being able to, to, to manage the workload. Like if, if we've got an influx of cases that are tickets that come in, the expectation is all hands on deck. Let's get involved in so-and-so. But then again, if it comes down to standard BAU, like I don't, I personally don't have an issue with you going off to one side and saying you want to take some time to improve on your skills and so-and-so. You might even want to take 10, 15 minutes to take the hoover out and clean up the house. But at the end of the day, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're involved in what's going on. It, it, you know, it would be right. an, an, mm. an inevitable kind of step for us to take regardless because we're in such a thriving technological world um, mm. it was uh, going to happen regardless and the whole allowance of working from home i feel as mm. if just it's just a, a, a plus on this yeah. definitely what's really going to be interesting sorry to interrupt you what's really going to be interesting is obviously come march when obviously lockdowns are uh, lifted um and we get back into some normality What's going to be interesting is, is that how do we then navigate as a service desk? How, what, what I'm really trying to get and the point that I'm making is, is that um, do we still have the facility or the function for individuals to actually work from home two or three days a week? Do we still have... have yeah, basically. I, I, just I, think, I think. I think. I think. I think. The yeah. world is to say. I think there's a real fundamental change going on. Yeah, there's um, a huge shift. And, you know, to, I think that there is going to be a huge shift away from. I think we would call with service desks the 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 old. For a lot of service desks, there's going to be a, a move away very much from the sort of call center environment. Mm -hmm. I think the, yeah. the the desks that have been successful at running virtually are gonna stay that way and i uh, you know i've spoken to this with a couple of people um about the opportunity space that creates because if you're you know and it, it depends on the size of the desk and the type of desk but say you're you're a multinational and you 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 you, you operate in a number of countries and you've been tied to particular locations previously for staff and for talent all of a sudden you've got an opportunity space because you can now think I can recruit people remotely in very different places around the world. And, you know, both myself and Bavel, we worked with a, a particular company and they, one of their 
challenges has always been around language requirements. They're in mm. very, you know, 30, 35 different countries. And the main languages that have been on the service desk have been um, Chinese, English, and Spanish. And you start to see things like, oh, we've got, we've, got a, we've got a growing Eastern Europe presence. No, we, but we only operate in Kuala Lumpur, the UK, and, and the US. What do we do? Now, mm. You can suddenly think, ah, we could start recruiting a service desk analyst in wherever, Krakow, Poland, or something like that. You know, mm. you're not suddenly, oh, can I get particular languages in a particular center, which can prove quite difficult if you're trying to recruit certain types of speakers in certain types of countries. All of a sudden, your whole dynamic has changed with regards to recruiting talent. Um, and you also, you, you, you start to find that because you have a pool of resources in a lot of these companies you already have a pool of resources they could call upon. I know in the company that we're working in, you suddenly find that what were your on-site remote staff, suddenly they're not working on site. They're looking for something to do. And all of a sudden you've got a ready made second, third line support that can come into the service desk, which is crucial because one mm -hmm. of the things that people moan about the most is, how long it takes to get something fixed. Why have I got to call back? Why have I got to wait around? You've suddenly got this pool of talent there that can fix things much quicker and get things done much quicker. Yeah. I, I think all, all absolutely that, that stigma, the, the shift from that stigma is, is very much here. Um, if it hasn't hit organizations, it, it's about to hit because that, that change needs to happen. And, and Jerome, to your point about, you know, what's going to, what's going to happen uh, uh, post March, April, whatever it is, you know, the norm is being redefined as I think you're hearing from what everybody's saying. And, and therefore yeah. companies are being forced to think about what are going to be our flexible working policies? What are, what are our remote working policies going to be? And those are going to be, you know, offered as a, as a standard, you know, because that, that you know, as we just said that that stigma is kind of, um, shifting away and uh, has shifted away. Um, coming back to your question, Vic, around things that you know we're doing to drive this. You know, one of the things that I link up to what Francis was saying and a little bit of what Glenn was saying is, you know, we talked about knowledge, and I think a key part of this critical function, which is now even more critical because of the way it's operating, is driving consistency across the board, and and that really can come through talent, knowledge sharing, um, and, and knowledge creation. I think those are some of the things that I've been driving in the place I am at, was doing it before uh, we, together with, with Glenn. And how do we make sure that that cross training is taking place? You know, because we are all remote. We need to drive more and more lunch and learn type activities to share our experiences um, so that we, we grow from there. Um, and I think that for me, that has been a, a real um, uh, eye opener into the into the business as to how much kind of we, we put into people's heads. And then, and then when this type of thing happens, they just walk out with it or, or walk away with it and, and documenting that knowledge becomes so prime. Another thing is communication. Um, I think we indirectly probably touched on it already, but communication is, is so key across the, 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 the service just now because of the level of sophistication that goes on with the service desk or could go on with the service desk. And therefore, you know, it's really important that they are in the loop of when changes are taking place, uh, you know, significant changes, how do we manage problems and actually communications out from the service desk, you know, how do we be proactive in that message to let the user know, ah, we're, we're aware of this issue. This is going on. How do we advertise that? How do we, um, show that empathy uh, in, in that communication as well. I think for me, those are the, the two or three things I think that start driving towards one of our points today, which is about how do we drive a first-class service desk, you know? And, and we have to be, this is not a one-time exercise. I think Glenn, Francis, you guys would agree with me that this is something that we has to be a constant. Yeah, we, we have to keep at this on a, on a regular basis to just keep up with um, everything that might be going on. Yeah, I, th I think you've all touched on how the, the pressures uh, have, have kind of increased with you all being, you know, working from home and people wanting things fixed immediately. I mean, have there been a, any other kind of teething problems, any other issues that you guys have come across? 
I think, I guess one one of the things I'd probably call out, and and maybe it's summed up in in a word, um, flexibility. Um, you know, I, I think from from my point of view, you know, again linked to maybe the the previous um, uh, message we were talking about, you know, the, the old stigma about. Uh, working from the office, etc. Um, flexibility has been a, a key part of uh, of this change, I think, um, and and being able to kind of understand actually that people have kids at home and you know they are doing homeschooling, uh, all these kind of activities, and how do we make sure that the right balance, work-life balance, is is identified? I think for me that has been a, a real um, tricky one. Glenn, Francis, have you noticed any other particular issues in, in transfer, transferring over to working from home? Yeah, as I say, I think it's, it's more, you know, it's, it's a good news story from that point of view as far as service desk, service desk goes. I think, you know, you come into certain aspects of service desk where things get interesting. Um, I think you have to think on your feet a lot more. I think there's a whole piece around, for instance, I don't know what other people think, but I know one of the big challenges I'm seeing it in the new role that I've just taken on this week and where I was previously, all of a sudden you've got to think on your feet with regards to things like starters and leavers. Um, I think particularly, you know, if you're, you, you're getting kicked to somebody at home, you've really got to go back to these kind of processes with the microscope and start to look at how they work and really think because they are really really important i read a statistic last week around the amount of people that, that don't stay in an organization beyond a month which was astounding the amount of people that quit their jobs within a month of starting a new organization and they directly attribute it towards onboarding and the service desk has a really big role to play in onboarding staff and also you know, deboarding staff as well and the pandemic has created a real challenge there um, of actually getting people on boarded and uh, making sure from day one that they are effective. And, you know, there's still a lot of, you know, we're, we're a year into it. And I think a lot of companies still haven't got that right as well. And I think that there's still a lot of work to be done on how people do that, that piece of work. Um, yeah. So just, just off the back of what, um, Glenn said as well is 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 kind of uh, taking a microscope and and looking at your processes end to end like joiners move and leavers was one of the, one of the things uh, I would say one of the biggest challenges again is is trying to seamlessly get um, your new starter on board to get that kind of uh, experience that the 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 company has uh, kind of um, said that oh if you join this organisation this is the happy type of uh, experience or the environment you guys will be joining and so on so and it's, it is kind of was the the transition of of the mindset of working in an office to to now working from home i mean my previous um, organization just just before the the pandemic we had the the lack of um looking at most of our process from end to end we are kind of like a a, con a continuous improvement function and it's now kind of highlights that well you have to now install that into your your analysts on, on a day-to-day -day basis so it's not just the standard oh we move from the office to working from home uh, our day-to-day -day processes are the same you now have to uh, allow your engineers to see where there's waste in processes for working from home come together collaborate as like one unit to say listen this is not working from this this actual process is not working from where we are now how can we improve it and so on and yeah, some organizations were actually prepared. Like one of the biggest ones, the most simplest thing that some organizations miss, and we kind of caught it just beforehand, was a, uh, I know Jerome said it before, was a VPN act. Something as simple as VPN. And uh, so many organizations were in positions where, um, one, your, your, your customers don't even know how to access VPN. So you've, you've got, the, that on, on, on a list of trying to train your customers on how to now yeah. access VPN from working from home yeah. to now yeah. giving your, your customers access to VPN. So I was in an organization where we had uh, roughly about four and a half, transitioning four and a half thousand people to working from home. And you can only imagine that 
20% of them only already had VPN access and now we've got an influx of uh, incidents or, or service requests that are coming in to get access to this. Oh, we've now mm -hmm. granted you access and now the, the next type of tickets that are coming in is, oh, what do I do next? So it's now training <laughs> yeah. these type That's of it. things like how do I use VPN and so on. So, so yeah, yeah. 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 One of the ones. <laughs> you know, one thing that for me, as like I said, working um, with the for the go between between boss and the, the guys on the team, um, one thing that well, a few things that this pandemic has really offered us as well is is that as a as a as an individual, um, you've got time to up your skills. You know, you've got to look at where it is. You've got so much opportunity now to look at what areas I'm, I'm sure that obviously uh, Bavin and Glenn were just saying about what areas that there's so many, there's so many more areas that are going to be available to you. So when you look at it from a, from a, from a, from a support point of view is, you know, if you want to, if you, if you want to do the desktop support role, then, you know, it's going to be potentially on a, on a on a remote um uh in a remote way but then when you look at it from a different point of view you've got that opportunity to look at cloud-based um infrastructure you've got that opportunity to turn around and say to yourself okay i want to go and do aws or i want to go and do gcp or i want to go and look at other ways that i can still support the business but from a cloud infrastructure or from a cloud point of view so, you know, so there's lots of opportunities. There's a hell of a lot of opportunities out there for you at the moment. Yeah, I, I think, you know, Service Desk is one of those entry uh, positions into technology. And like you said there, Jerome, you can, um, you can go down the cloud route, whatever area you're, you're looking to, to go down. Um, we've, we've kind of touched a little bit on the customer service aspect of the role. Um, I'd be quite interested to hear... Uh, you know, people's thoughts on how that has changed with working from home and, and the, the real kind of importance of, of the customer service aspect of it. It becomes more important than ever. Yeah. You, 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 more than ever, you are that, you are, as I said, you are the shop window, you are the face of IT. In some cases, you're the face of the company. There will be people that basically, some of the first people they talk to in the company will be the service desk when they join a company. It, it becomes so, so important and people that have got good customer service skills will be at the forefront going forward because it, it just, it just, you know, you are, you are the lifeline to that person and you, you really do have to show empathy. You really have to help them through. And sometimes you are spending time really talking people that have very limited IT knowledge and really having to help them through. So the whole service mentality becomes so, so important. And, you know, the days of, you know, what was, you know, a, a few years ago, what would it help? I don't like to use the word help desk. I refuse to use it. Um, but, but the old style help desk, that really, it, you know, I think the word service is there for a reason. Yes, and that's what a service desk is now. It really has to be that kind of. It is that, you know. I, I keep saying the word shop window. It's on my LinkedIn profile, but I really, really believe so much that you know, it is the shop window. It really yeah. is. And if if you have a ugly display, people just won't want to know, and they will take that reputation away. If you give them an attractive offer, and at that first point of contact that you have with IT, you've got people. Yeah. Yeah. People skills have never been more important than than during this time. You know, I'm doing a lot of recruitment at the place I am at now. Uh, we're a managed service provider, and you know, and you, you know, one of the mandatory qualities that we look for is is people skills. You know, uh, technical skills, tools. You can learn that on the job. You can get trained on that. But the people skills is is a really key point to to what Glenn was saying, and and actually that for me that kind of stems um st really stands out in in terms of that that first impression you know and buzzwords in the industry at the moment are user ex experience you know cx and ux these are two things that are really 
a prime KPI that a lot of companies that are ahead of the game are really capitalizing on and, and trying to understand actually, what do we now need to do to improve our customer experience, whether that's from an individual interaction perspective or any other channels that you may ha be offering at the service desk for your users, you know, whether it's chat, self-service portal, and how are those interactions um, making uh, the life of the, the user really, really simple and efficient. And you have to go back on, uh, on that as well. I think the other the other thing to think about when you think about customer service, I think, and uh, as I said earlier in the conversation, a lot of service desks, a lot of IT departments have won a lot and lot of goodwill during the pandemic because they have been the lifesavers for a lot of companies. But as I always say to people, you're only good, you're only as good as your last gig. And it's, it's almost now the, the gauntlet has been thrown down to frontline support, let alone service discs. That you know, the game, the, you know, you, you've got a seat at the table. Now you've really, really got to up your game to make sure that you mm -hmm. remain at the table, that you keep that reputation up because mm -hmm, yeah. it can all go wrong very quickly. You know, it, it's a real exciting time, I think, for anybody involved with service discs because you, you. It, you know, particularly a lot of companies because you've been given that you've been given a bit of a blank check and there's there's also the, the also you know a lot of companies are starting to look very differently and suddenly whereas before and i don't know if anybody else is seeing this but but i know that from the conversation i've had whilst i've been looking for a role let alone with with the role that i'm starting you know whereas before it's always been oh, service desk we can't really afford we can't really we're not really interested in it's always cost cut cost cut cost cut and yeah. doing more for less i think now people are starting to think well if we're going to invest money it's the frontline services we need to invest in because people yeah. are working at home people are working away they need that security blanket they need that safety net there yeah well help this now has become an asset you, you, you know help desk is is um just touching on what you said glenn you know, sometimes when you're working with companies, companies feel like, you know, they're pumping money into a black hole. You know, you're sitting down there like, okay, yeah, I need this or the department needs this to do. And, you know, it kind of felt, well, previously it kind of felt like, you know, you always have to justify what it is that you need to, to, to unpurchase. Um, now it's like, okay, you know, because there's been things that, um, that um, I've suggested to my company and, um, you know, I haven't been as scrutinized as I had been maybe previously, you know, because, you know, when you're coming with a, a, a function that potentially is going to resolve or just alleviate certain issues that your company's having, you know, they're more receptive now to kind of sit down with you and kind of think about and, and, and look at it. In, in its entirety and, and, and as a bigger picture. Um, just kind of touching as well on, um, on what you were saying, Vic, about the whole service this experience. Um, pros and cons, in my opinion, one of the cons for me is, is that, um, I'm not sure if anybody else feels like this, but um, you know, when you're on the service desk and you are that kind of face or you are the first person that, um, that uh, uh, a, a new starter talks to what it kind of feels like is is that um, instead of kind of doing your hours you're kind of overcompensating and you have to be available maybe a little bit over time you know because you want to kind of say to yourself well, okay I'm putting in you kind of have to put in that extra bit of effort you know which is not a problem but then when you look at it from the bigger picture you know you're contracted to do 37 and a half hours a week you realise that, you know, at the end of the week, you may have done 40, 45 hours, you know, and you're only getting paid for the 37 and a half, you know, just kind of things that some of the guys have, 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 have said to me how they feel, you know, is, is, you know, working from home, you know, there's that kind of emphasis on you always have to be available. Always have to be available. I yeah, think... Right. Uh, good point, Jerome. And uh, I think one of the things for me kind of really, really strongly related to that is recognition. Um, and we need to, you know, we might have been doing an element of that before, 
But I think, you know, as part of the communication uh, piece that I, I was talking about earlier and, and we touched on earlier, I think recognition is equally, equally important. Um, you know, that, that reward reward versus consequence type thing, you know, yes, when something does go wrong, something needs to be done as well. But, you know, recognition is, I, I cannot stress how, how important that is right now to, to ensure that the, the service we are delivering grows and and doesn't dip dip back backwards because we've set a, a benchmark that could be very very high now and we, wanna, we just need to meet and accept exceed those expectations that we've, we've set right because with this shift uh, to remote working the expectations that anybody had from a typical service desk have all been reset in one way shape or form and, and i think uh, the new new expectation therefore is much much higher um and and keeping up with that i think is really really important so so reward rewarding and recognizing the the success of the teams and shouting out about in, about that i th- is is really really important uh, and this is one uh, lesson that i've actually learned uh, from from glenn in 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 a previous lifetime but but yeah i, I cannot stress about that I think just to add to that, Jason Hope here, um, what's um, held me in good stead um, throughout this pandemic is not only have I always thought about customer care, but also team care, right? So, and I think it's been a big thing throughout this pandemic to extend that around all the issues around mental health to ensure that you're touching on the pulse of the team and understanding how they're doing. So I think that's held me in good stead. Yeah, I absolutely agree. You know, the the number of times I, I hear about um, team quizzes going on or, you know, a level of entertainment, right. whether it's a, a simple, you know, a, a tea and biscuit conversation on a, on a right. Friday morning for 30 minutes. I, I think those types of things are, are really, really critical and, and important um, and really touches uh, on, a, on an individual at a personal level, um, which I, I think you know the, the what I said at the very beginning that people have lost touch with people and and this is another way of just making sure that actually we're doing that check in with with our teams uh, because th- this asset is now even more critical into the organization or into the team absolutely yeah. so you've you've all touched on you know there's there's been a bit more of an investment within the service desk. And, uh, you know, you need to recognize these guys and, and take care of them. So how, how do you then um, upskill them and, and develop them for, you know, the, the future areas that they're going to go into within IT? I think for me, um, having a, a regular um, discussion around their development plans is, is a key part of the, the management activity, right? So understanding where the aspirations are, understanding actually how we can we can take time to support this individual's growth um, in the organization and you know in in some cases it may be possible in some cases it may not be but I think keeping that discussion open and active throughout a uh, financial year of the organization, you know, not just talking about it at the beginning of an appraisal and objective setting exercise and coming to it at the at the end of the year. No, I think it's really important at least once a month, once every second month, having re, re-energizing that, that conversation to say, okay, well, do you remember you, you were talking about this? And, and uh, by the way, we might have an opportunity that might be coming up or a secondment type activity. And, you know, I would strongly you know, recommend um, uh, teams or or wider IT teams to think about actually, if there is an individual who's got an aspiration to grow um, and you you have an opportunity, do consider this individual um, to come in to give them a a stab at this because one, they already are in your organization. They they know the the culture, they know the teams, they know a lot of aspects within the organization and therefore the upskilling you know, the, 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 the learning curve may not be as steep as somebody new uh, that might be joining the organization. So I think for me, it opens up a number of uh, number of avenues, but equally service desk analysts are always, uh, not always, let's say, focused on how do, how do I keep my personal development plan active, right? So we have to activate, it is our, our duty as, as leaders or, or managers to really emphasize that they own 
their development plan, you know, and they need to raise that subject and, and communicate about that on a regular basis. Okay, um, definitely echo what Bavin just said there. Um, for me, it's key to have that, that post check with the um, um, team, uh, understand their aspirations, and then as a leader, align that with the wide organization that I have that connection with. So I always have this, um, um, even if it's not a, uh, a, a um, formal second line alignment to other teams, I force that narrative with other other leaders within the ICT organization. Um, and I, I see my my role as a springboard to those agents, those technicians, and um, I get lots of results from that. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, I'll be a little bit controversial. Oh, sorry, carry on. No, I'll be a little bit controversial here. And I think we have to, sometimes we have to think a little bit differently to what we did pre-pandemic. We, you know, this whole conversation has been about the re-emphasis upon the service desk, the focus on the service desk, the evolution of the service desk. And I think a part of that, we have to get away from this kind of thinking that you have to, you know, it's, it, you know the service desk is just a stepping stone. And as the service desk develops, they're going to become, you know, who, you know, the way in which service desk is evolving there for some people, I'm not saying for everybody, but for some people, there's a career in itself all the way up through a service desk instead of just thinking, oh, yeah, it's just a stepping stone into something else. Because you, because if you've got a shift left agenda, which an awful lot of service desks have got as well, then the technical skills are going to grow within the service desk. Mm -hmm. and, and, and organizations need to start thinking less about the service desk just being a stepping stone and more is how do you grow that service desk from within and how you use that talent to grow the service desk because it, it, because I've seen it so often that you just have continual churn on the service desk and the service desks that are successful are the ones that don't have that churn and that really build an established team and keep that team together for as long as possible so that they grow together as a team. But on that point, point yeah. on that yeah. point though, Glenn is, is that you have to keep the IT, whether it be, men or women, you have to keep them engaged. You have to keep them kind of, you know, if there's a, if there's an area that they want to go into, like I'll take for, yeah, like I'll take for instance, the, the um, company that I'm working for at the moment, um, I've expressed, um, I've expressed my, 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 I've expressed that I want to go into a, 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 a different area. Now, you know, my boss has said to me, yep, yeah, that's fine. The only thing that he kind of stipulates is, is that it doesn't interfere with your day-to-day -day work. You know, so it's all well and good. Mm. You, you know, we're saying, you know, I appreciate what you're saying, Glenn, 100%. You know, no, I don't, to what I mean, yeah, I think there's yeah, a balance. Yeah, I, what I'm yeah, saying is right. I think there's a balance between, yeah. between some people. Yeah, I don't think what companies should do is... is mm. Some companies, and it's encouraged within IT, and it comes back to this kind of before the pandemic, and we, you know, we, it was almost at the start of the conversation. You know, the the, the, the it, it's like the, the fuzzy end of the lollipop, and I think that we have to start getting away from that. And it's not, you know, for, for some people, of course, it's going to be a stepping stone into other mm. things, but with shift left, and with the service, the way service tests are evolving, and more and more. You know, new, uh, new applications, stuff being in the cloud can be managed from within the service desk. You have to change that kind of the automatically as a stepping stone in that there are choices to grow within a service desk environment I, for um, some people. It's yeah, Claire it's again. Cool. Hi. Um, okay. I took on um, apprentices previously, school leavers, 18, um, knowing that they had a two year commitment. Um, and that was something that worked really well. You know, they were fresh. They were keen to learn. Um, and, you know, obviously technology is growing all the time. They had the ability to learn so much in that two year period. So yeah. the idea of shift left, as you say, take on two apprentices. We um, made it made a pathway to second line for the first line team and also across to the application team. So I think if you if you look at that really carefully, like you say, you can build that whole team and retain mm. that knowledge for an awfully long time. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, then just he took he took the words right out. I was just about to drop about shift left as well. Exactly, exactly along them lines. 
um, I think it's an opportunity. Again, you've got your time back to you. It's, it's, it's the confidence and uh, you kind of, uh, and the trust you have within your team. Like, you now have an opportunity to, to look at end-to-end -end processes, not just across the service desk, across the whole tech support function, where it's gone to first to third line or fourth line, and then engaging and collaborating with other tech support teams within tech support to now ask them, uh, do, you, do you reckon we can actually pull that process within the service desk? And that inevitably then grows the service desk in itself. Um, uh, Jerome, your, your viewpoint where your, your, your manager uh, says kind of don't, don't kind of get that involved in your day-to-day, -day. I, I feel as if you, you should kind of look at it as an opportunity individually for yourself as mm. personal support. Like you can somehow somewhat bring that into your day-to-day and naturally, it just becomes part of the service desk. That's right, yeah. Just to reiterate what these guys uh, have, have said again um, mm. before, it, um, we, we're no longer the, the, the runt of the litter, per se. Like, everybody <laughs> is now actively engaging, like, what's happening? Like, the service mm. need help. The influx of tickets are coming. We need, to get, we need to give them a hand. So we now have a seat at the table to kind of voice our opinions and our concerns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's um, it's uh, it's it's interesting, isn't it? Because you want to keep, as I think Glenn mentioned, you want to keep the teams engaged and you want to keep a team together and and not have that disharmony with people constantly moving, but managing that so that people's um, career expectations can also be met. Um, you you guys also kind of touched on that, you know, developing the service desk and and getting people to stay on there. So. I guess my question is really, you know, what is the future of the service desk? I know we've, we've kind of mentioned AI and chatbots, but where do you guys see it going in the next five years? Um, one big word I'll say is automation. As much automation as possible to make life a bit more easier. Um, cleaner, again, we're continuous improvement function within the service desk uh, to add on the back of automation. Again, uh, the example that we did with our self-service portal empowering our customers to, to, to then go and resolve their, their, um, the issues they raise themselves. So if, you, if you're logging a ticket on our uh, ticketing system, you've got the logic behind it to say, oh, uh, you've actually logged this issue before and this is how we resolved it. Would you like to take a shot at it? Or, um, or I need access to a printer. Boom, here's the documentation for it. So again, uh, the, the evolution of the service desk I see is pure automation down the line. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I think automation, um, keep, keeping up with innovating as well, uh, continuing to grow and, and innovate um, to, to keep this critical function ahead of the game. Um, and whether you, whether you look at kind of people, process, technology, whatever it is around that, any, any innovation is going to keep, help keep um, um, you ahead of the game. Um, in in my mind, at least, uh, Glenn Glenn might come in as a as a devil's advocate on this one. But um, uh, in my mind, bots are never going to fully be able to take over because the, the like human it. touch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the day is you you can have all the technology you want yeah. at the end of the day, and it's yeah. all really really important. But the human touch becomes even more important. I think we touched on yeah. it already. The pandemic has has just been an app absolute game changer that customer service that empathy that human touch is going to be so important still going mm. forward and it's it's getting that balance right between progress with technology but still being able to be that face at the end of the day yeah. if you don't have that then it won't it won't work uh, absolutely and and i think um, the combination and that's where for me the customer service Piece really, really stands yeah. out um, with is with the people um, rather than just the technology, and and that makes a makes a makes a huge difference. Yeah. Perfect. Well, um, does anyone else have any questions or, or anything else they'd like to raise with the guys? Uh, I guess it's been relatively interactive, hasn't it? And um, it has, people yeah. have been asking questions as, as time's gone by. But um, yeah, it's, it's been really great to, to hear from you guys. Um, yeah, service desk is, is an area I've 
always been interested in it's kind of my bread and butter as well so it's been really good to hear um how things have changed for you guys and and how um you, you think it's going to change in the future and um yeah just want to thank thank everyone on here for for your time and really uh really good to hear your insight thank you oh, thank, thank you. you thank you for making it interesting as well thank you yeah no very interesting and informative thanks everyone speak to you soon bye thanks a lot guys cheers guys bye bye bye